very dynamic talk, so we ask him to repeat somehow tonight. Yes, so I'm going to try to repeat what I did, but I also was going to try to summarize what the other panelists said. We had a really great panel, Strong Voices, as well as people who then responded to the panel, Strong Voices, and so I'm going to hope to call on some Walt Whitman here and be large enough to contain the multitude of voices that were spoken during that panel for us. Um, one of the disclosures that I want to give, I stole from Gilly, who was one of the panelists. She reminded us that people should be first. She said patience, but I'd like to say people should be first. And she also believes that we should be looking for solutions, not problems. And we should be settling on data, not opinions. And this one I really took to heart because it's something that I always seem to do. If you don't do it, no one will. Whatever that is that remains to be done, if you're not going to pick up those pieces and do it, who is? Um, so these are the speakers of the panel. We had Olivier who introduced it to us. We had Jintanat who talked about the HIV cure perspective on trial design, going into populations and study design and treatment interruptions and some endpoints. We had Jean-Philippe who had talked about the cancer perspective. Thomas talked about the inclusion of participants with HIV in cancer trials, which I'll go into more. Then there was me, which we'll find out about. And then Gilly then talked about the cancer perspective in terms of uh, participation. And then Sharon was actually the one who moderated our panel uh, discussion afterwards. Um, this was already hit on a little bit, but it really hit home for me because part of my job is at Fred Hutch, uh, Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. And when I go out into the community around Seattle, people are always like, what is HIV doing over in the Cancer Research Center? And I have so many answers, but I also have developed a more of a, a response just from participating in this panel. Two major causes of death in the world. They can affect anyone, both of them, HIV or cancer. You could be a baby or you could be 99 years old and get either of those. And it affects everyone everywhere on this earth, as well as the immune system is unable to eliminate those cancer cells just like it can't eliminate the HIV cells. Um, there's also a lot of similarities. Um, we've had a great improvement in survival in both HIV with the advent of art, and we have also in the 2000s with immunotherapy, some really great turnarounds in survival in, with cancer. But the cures in both are limited by the persistence of those rare cells. Both are seen to be invisible to the immune system, and the, they have uh, common or shared mechanisms of persistence. And the goal is really to either kill or control these rare events that are happening. And the other thing that really struck home to me is that there's really no good test yet to detect those cells that we're trying to get rid of. So I was really affected by those. Also, the strategies of trying to treat them are sort of the same. We're trying to act on the infected cells of HIV, which is a lot of the shock and kill, trying to wake them up. And then you're trying to improve the immune control, and we have that example of HIV controllers. And on the cancer side, you had sort of the same sort of things, trying to target the cancer cells, and then trying to improve the immune control of cancer um, with the immunotherapies that we have. I just found all of those things very sort of telling that they were sort of similarities uh, that we had. Uh, Jintanat pointed out some things about selection of participants, that first of all, females, we need more participation of people who are biologically born female or identify as female or identify as the sex they were assigned at birth as female. Um, uh, the balancing of risks between the pregnancy and the harm to infants with some of these novel uh, therapies that we have. And she actually brought up the idea of maybe um, directly observed therapy for contraception like Depo for some of the interventions as a solution to that. She brought up infants and children um, possibly being superior in their response to the immune therapies, which I found surprising. Um, and also that certain interventions should uh, be studied for remission in infants alongside or even before the adults. And I thought that was an interesting point that she made. She also brought up that adolescents might have uh, ad uh, adherence difficulties, but they also possibly had more to gain or the most to gain from remission. Um, and she also brought up resource-limited settings and that participants should be able to participate no matter where they are, um, even if they're in a resource-limited setting, even in the proof-of-concept studies, um, even though the access issues may not be worked out in their part of the world, that they should still be included in those. And I thought that was important to bring up. Um, she also brought up some stuff about study design that I wanted to share with you. Um, one of the things that really stuck with me, it came up and then someone from the audience also brought it up, was coming up with common protocols to test different products of the same class over time, is, was her point. And she brought up with BNABs and vaccines, where you could sort of just plug in a new BNAB or plug in a new vaccine, but already have the rest of the protocol worked out to sort of streamline and speed up those things. 
And then someone from the audience towards the end when we had our open discussion brought up the idea that maybe the IAS should create a working group to work out sort of protocols like this where it would just be easily adapted to a specific product in mind. And I thought it was just one of those ideas that I wanted to share and give voice to because I thought, hmm, that seemed like a really promising working group to work out certain protocols and work out the nuts and bolts of that so someone could come along with a product and just sort of have a quicker way to get a protocol off the ground. Um, Thomas Oldrick really brought up some things that I found interesting to hear. So he was talking about people who live with HIV participating in cancer trials. And so we've already heard about the increased uh, longevity in people who are living with HIV, which means things like cancer are coming up more and more common. Um, the thing that he brought up to us was that these people are often excluded from trials in cancer because of their HIV, and that they've been working out really some sort of new way of trying to incorporate people so that we can have these novel uh, products tested in research. And so his principles that he brought up to us, um, that we are looking for people who are living with HIV or otherwise healthy, that the specific HIV and CD4 related criteria may vary for a study, but what we wanted is people who have a low risk for AIDS outcomes and that the eligibility criteria may evolve with the drug development experience and that it shouldn't be more stringent than the criteria for the general population. It was really about trying to get people with HIV involved in cancer studies. And I really found that interesting because on the HIV cure and the HIV treatment research, often people who have cancers are excluded from HIV trials. And I found it ironic that here we have on the one side, the cancer side trying to welcome in HIV positive people into their studies, and I'm hoping that on the HIV treatment and cure side, we will have similar conversations and welcome in people who may have had cancers, may currently have a cancer, because I know personally the people in my group, my CAB for instance, who are excluded from trials continuously because they had cancer at one time. And it's really a difficult thing because they are the people who are really wanting to give back and help advance the research towards cure. And so I wanted to bring this up just simply because we didn't talk about it at the panel, but it was one of those things that I kept on wanting to say, hey, wait a second, wait a second, you know what? We need to do the same thing in terms of HIV trials and see how we can't welcome in more cancer. Kind of have developed this idea of where we were and what was the motives for recruitment and for people getting involved. So way back in the 80s, people were trying to stay alive, and that was the motivation to get involved in HIV trials. People had an urgent and personal need to stay alive, and so that's a highly motivating factor to seek out research and to participate in it. Once we had uh, antiretroviral therapy, the game sort of changed a little bit. What people really needed research for was then access to those drugs. Oftentimes people would find out they were positive and had no health care, and so they used research as a way to sort of access those drugs. And a lot of the trials of that time for treatment were looking for treatment naive individuals, people who had never been on medicine before. So it was a nice marriage of their needs and our needs. So access was then the motivating factor for getting involved. But that leads us to today, where we have otherwise healthy individuals who are living with HIV, and what is the motivating factor to get involved in a research trial, especially one around cure? Altruism. Selflessness. So you have very selfish, very self-interested motivations in the beginning, people trying to stay alive, access things that they need to stay alive, to altruism. You can see that sort of already shrinks the pool of eligible people 